Hi, this is your host, Apni Bharatiya, and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Devrat Rishi, CEO and co founder of Pedibase. Devrat, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, really nice to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure to host you here today. And this is the first time I'm talking to you. So I would love to know a bit about the history and the story of the company. What led you to co-found this company? Yeah, you know, like a lot of, uh, I think, entrepreneurship journeys, it's a long winding one that culminates in some moments that happen quickly. Uh, but the long winding journey is, you know, I always had my academic background in computer science, statistics, and machine learning, uh, and spent time and a number of years as a product manager at Google. I was working on different teams, Firebase, which is an acquired startup, um, Google Research on productionizing ML. But I spent most of my time on uh, Google Cloud on the platform that eventually became Vertex AI, which is the way that uh, GCP packages its AI services externally. And while I was there, I was also the first PM for Kaggle, a data science and machine learning community Google acquired in 2017. Kaggle had just under a million users when I joined um, and has over 14 million users today. And, you know, when I was there, I didn't realize that that many people knew the basics of machine learning or NumPy and Pandas. Um, and so it was really an incredible time to see just the organic lift. At the same time I was seeing that, there were a lot of organizations that on Vertex were just really struggling to get any value out of ML. And so I saw like this, you know, two-part dichotomy. And in 2020, I met my co-founders, Piero, Travis, and Chris. And actually, my co-founder, Piero, had the idea for what eventually became Predabase that was just built on top of a tool that he had made for himself while he was at Uber. He was a machine learning researcher that had to work on a number of different projects, and he felt like he was reinventing the wheel each time. So he made a tool called Ludwig that made his life easier, that made the life of other engineers at the company easier, and eventually open sourced it in 2019, and had an idea for how to bring it easier for any organization to build models at the end of 2020. So we all got excited about that, and we started right at the very beginning of 2021, as soon as the vaccines came out, uh, and we've been working and operating ever since. If I ask you to s- summarize Pretty Base, how would you summarize the company? I would say that we're you know, a platform for developers that want to productionize open source AI models. So if you're an engineer who wants to be able to use one of those open source models that you've been reading a lot about and start to be able to fine tune it on your data, and then serve that model inside of your organization, then Predibase is the right platform for you. And we've actually always been built on a platform and a foundation of deep learning models that support many different types of use cases. But especially in 2023, the primary thing we lead with for our customers is fine tuning and serving fine tuned open source large language models. So we think that you know some of the large Gen AI applications uh, and Gen AI APIs are a great place to get started. But increasingly, the future is open source and the future is fine-tuned. And that's where Predibase really plays into. How important is open source of Predibase? Predibase is actually a company built on top of open source projects and around the open source ecosystem. So we are both big believers in, as well as, you know, um, the platform to allow people to use open source. And it's been important to us in two ways. One, in the ways that we've contributed to the community, and two, the ways that the community has contributed back to us. So we have built two open source projects, one for training machine learning models called Ludwig that has over 10,000 stars on GitHub today. And then the second is a new project that just got open source last month called Lorax, which is a really efficient way to be able to serve open source fine-tuned models and especially be able to serve hundreds of models for the cost of one. Lorax is the reason that we have the most cost-effective way to be able to deploy open source models in the market today. And so it's been really critical to the way that we've developed technology and the way we've wanted to give back. And then we've, of course, benefited a lot from the fact that some of the best models coming out today are actually open sourced. Because what we want to do is allow organizations to own their own models and own their own IP. If you use an external commercial API today, that that API owner really owns the models, the weights that you're using and you're consuming by an API. And we think as more organizations see AI as core to their strategy, they're actually going to want to own the models, own the weights, own all the direct infrastructure that goes around it and have full agency. And that's only possible with the open source models. And so that's really where we think, uh, you know, we want to be able to play in. And uh, beyond models, because when we do talk about AI, especially now we talk about generative AI, LLMs a lot, uh, uh, 
it's not as easy as the old LAMP stack, you know, where everything is fully open source. It becomes more complicated. Even if you look at OpenAI, the, the, the word open is there, but it's not open source, you know. Uh, so, so talk about uh, generative AI, AI in general and open source. What are the things that you feel are, should be open source? Or what are the things that you should, you know, no, that cannot be open source. You should like, no, it can be open source as the LAMP stack. As well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we think that, um, and this has always been true for AI, actually, which is we think that the models and the weights of the models should be open source. And I think Meta and uh, you know Facebook's uh, AI research lab have really led the way here with some of the Llama 2 variants that came out and love to see some other strong open source models come out, like the ones that came out recently last week with Mistral. So those essentially concepts open source the architecture and then some of the weights that have been used from the model training job. And we're really grateful to the organizations that release that. The great thing about that is it gives every other company a great starting point. Being able to train some of these models from scratch can cost you know, tens of millions of dollars in order to be able to do. So if you wanna get started, there's a really high barrier to entry, which when a company open sources the model architecture and weights, they reduce and make it easier for any organization and startups and tech companies and any other enterprise to be able to start to adopt it right out of the box without having that large barrier to entry to get started. The piece that we think makes sense to be more commercial is on the infrastructure. So that means, you know, the way that you actually orchestrate the compute so you make it possible to be able to have a customer's um, model be trained and fine-tuned on their own data. Uh, the second piece is the data itself. Of course, we don't think, you know, companies should open source the proprietary data. Instead, what we want to be able to do is bring the models to their data. Uh, and be able to bring the models into a layer that allows them to customize and fine tune that on their data. And then finally, the infrastructure that allows customers to be able to serve these models inside their organization as well. We think that infrastructure, you know, we've open sourced some of the implementations around it. But at the end of the day, you probably want to go use a platform just like people use AWS today for you know, managing their compute in order to be able to get the actual underlying access towards it. So the techniques in our, mi our mind are, um, you know, nothing magical and nothing that should be kept away from the broader public. The infrastructure on how to get that, you know, actual, those techniques to work in production, in practice, on your internal data, that's the piece that we see as commercial. When we look at open source, uh, just before you, I had a conversation uh, with someone from Linux Foundation. They came up with a report, you know, so that how the global communities can get involved because something that is happening is now, which is more or less like uh, techno nationalism, where the companies are trying to keep, the, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of different reasons, sovereignty is there, and then a war is going on. So the collaboration is becoming more and more hard, and they, sometimes companies don't want to rely on a product of a particular, from a product country because you know US can have trade embargo and suddenly you get locked out. So open source does become a place where people can go and contribute. What but open source, you know, can be a company owned open source, open source can be a community owned open source, open source can be a neutral foundation owned open source. When this comes to AI, uh, just a few weeks ago, Biden administration they also came up with the executive order around, you know, to make generative AI more safe and secure. To just the way Linux kernel being open source, it kind of created the whole adoption. Kubernetes is another great example. So, so can you can you talk about when we look at AI, you know, LLMs, how open source and and what kind of home should be there for these technologies so that companies don't really have to worry about your competitor may pull the strings because they control it. It creates an even playing field. You also don't have to worry about the whole geopolitics that, hey, this project is coming from this country. Talk about what do you see uh, would be beneficial for, because we have to increase that option. So, so talk about. Definitely. Um, and so in terms of why open source, you know, I think there are a number of reasons, but one of the uh, customer quotes that actually encapsulated said the best for me is, look, generalized intelligence is great, but I don't need my point of sale system to recite French poetry. It's this idea that especially when organizations are deploying AI models, they don't need, you know, the full spectrum of artificial general intelligence to be able to solve every, like, you know, um, all, every, all tasks all in one place necessarily. What they need is a surgical toolkit where they can use the right scalpel, the right task for the individual thing they're looking to be able to automate. 
And open source actually provides that option and opportunity where you can go ahead and say, I don't need the one trillion parameter model or even the hundred billion parameter model. What I need is something small and right-sized to be able to automate my customer support tasks or to be able to do help me with fraud prediction. It's really about making sure you have the right tool for the job. And that's where the breadth of the open source community is really helpful. So taking a step back, what are the reasons why open source is really useful and like why we think it's going to dominate the overall industry? There's really three key reasons. The first is all about what you were talking about, which is vendor lock-in and preventing that. So today, if you're using for a service like OpenAI, you know, customers, I think, consistently notice strange patterns, whether that has to do with latency and availability. So sometimes, you know, the models will just uh, uh, fail to give a response at a certain point, you know, if you're querying them at too large of a rate. And if you've been on, you know, um, Twitter or X recently, you've probably noticed a lot of announcements about how OpenAI's performance has degraded over the last month. That's not anything you have control or agency over. And if AI is going to be core to your roadmap, then it seems really weird to be able to defer all of that control and agency towards like a third party. And so the first is really around agency and preventing vendor lock-in. The second core reason people really go into open source is for performance reasons. Um, and so here, you know, you might have a, a task or a model. We see this all the time. It does really well in building the prototype. It's a really good way to be able to, you know, start to show how you can summarize emails or something along those lines. But when you want to use it inside your organization, you need to go from like 80% to 99% overall. And that's where the combination of open source and fine tuning, I think, have been the most useful. We worked on an experiment on JSON generation where we were trying to extract information from text and basically come up with a structured representation. And, you know, um, GPT-4 got about 66% coverage out of the box on that task. But when we fine-tuned Llama 2 7 billion, a much smaller model, uh, you know, and much less capable than GPT-4 in a general purpose sense, but when we fine-tuned it on that data, we got up to 93%. And that was really impactful because it basically shows a larger performance gain for a lot more bang for your buck. And that final bang for your buck point is actually the third large reason why people go with open source which is today, the models that people are deploying are really expensive, they're quite slow. And instead, what open source allows you to do is right size the right model task. If you want a 1 billion parameter model, a 3 billion parameter model, a 7, a 13, a 34, a 70, all of those are available in the open source community. They're not all available through like commercial APIs, but they're all open source models that are available and you can choose the one that actually makes the right, the most sense for your task. And so that's where we think, you know, users are increasingly starting to see that adoption. You know, to end on this point, the number one thing I hear from customers today that are using Gen AI in production is, yeah, we built our prototype on OpenAI, or, you know, we built our demo using another commercial API, but we want to move off of it in the next six to 12 months. And we want to move off of it for exactly those three reasons that I was just mentioning. We can talk about open source. We can talk about all these projects as much as we want, but open source, these open source projects can solve only day zero or day one problem where you can get the code base, get it installed, get it up and running. Exactly. Uh, what about day two, day three, day four? Uh, so so that's where, um, I mean, you know, there's already that, that's where commercial players come to picture because that's the problem they solve. Uh, exactly. Of course, big, big, big players can, of course, have all the, but not everybody's Google, Microsoft, and Apple. Um, at the same time, the projects, they have their own limitations because they cannot take every use case and start, you know, embedding the, those codes to cater to a specific, you know, uh, customer, commercial players, you folks can very easily talk about the role of commercialization in the open source, you know, LLMs space. And of course, let's talk about your company. What role are you folks playing there? Exactly. So I like the day zero, day one analogy, right? Um, and if open source discovery, or even just finding out and building your first you know, demo with a Gen AI application is day zero, then Protobase is really day one and on. You know, um, it's the point at which you've seen the power of some of these models that exist. And now you have the questions of, how do I deploy this inside of my organization? How do I bring this to my data in a secure way that allows me to be able to get a performance lift and a customization? How do I make this available to be able to iterate across other collaborators in my organization? Those are all the key things that we think about inside of an organization. So when we started off, I described Protobase as, you know, 
the developer platform to productionize open source AI. Um, and so that's really what we're all oriented around. It's not in us inventing anything novel in the underlying models. It's about us making it easy to take those models that people have put out, great research labs, and make it something you can fit into that organization. Now, how do we do that? We have a platform today that anyone can try out for free. It's on Predibase.com. We have one of the best free trials actually on the market because you can both fine tune an open source large language model and serve it. And we give you the GPUs to do that out of the box. You can go ahead and try it out today and you'll really do three key things. The first is you'll connect your data. The second is you'll fine tune and train a model. And we make it easy for anyone to fine tune and train a model. And then the third is you'll be able to deploy that model so you can start to prompt it and start to get answers and requests back from it. We have a bunch of quick starts and guides that help you kind of walk through that. But we really think that's kind of the key thing that people need. They see these models out in the open source and they're curious, how do I get it to work inside my organization? How do I connect it to my data? How do I serve it? And that's what Predibase is really oriented on. As the adoption is growing, of course, it really depends from one use case to other use case. We cannot generalize it. But from Predibase point of view, from your perspective, what are some of the challenges or pain points that at least your customers or users face that you're like, hey, these are need needed to be addressed because these are still a problem that are cropping up? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just actually both uh, KubeCon as well as the Linux AI .dev converse, uh, conference, we actually had talks at both of those. So um, hopefully you'll have a chance to check those out and we'll consent over a recording as well. On the second point about, you know, what are the challenges that people are seeing, whether it's trust and safety and hallucinations or others, the key challenge that I'd say customers come to Predibase for are two things. Number one, it's actually efficiency. So um, they've gotten something working with a platform like OpenAI. You know, they've found a use case where they've uh, able, been able to either get a human in the loop system going, or it's a use case where the kind of erratic behavior of the model is still acceptable. So for example, maybe it's writing advertising copy and some of the advertising copy is a little bit strange, but that's okay if 95% of the advertising copy is good most of the time. And there's a review process for it. They found that use case. Where they come to us is they want to actually get the, to the point where this use case can be served in production at the most cost-effective way, in the most tailored way to be able to eke out the last bits of performance and to be able to make sure that's low latency and cost-effective. So when you think about you know, who's the normal um, Predibase customer persona, it's somebody that probably started their experimentation with OpenAI, as an example. Um, but and has figured out what use case they want to apply it to and want to go to the next level where they're actually thinking about a production setting for that model and they want to own that model. Um, and the reason they come to us is to be able to get that maximum efficiency. The second reason people come to us is, you know, I think that we're one of the forefront uh, um, companies like in fine tuning LLMs overall. And so they want to understand from us, like, what are the use cases? We talked to both like very large technology companies on a partnerships angle here. We talked to many mid-market other companies that are like looking to integrate this directly for their own use cases. But, you know, they really, we're really kind of talking in joint collaboration about some of the technology we've put out and how do we actually think about, you know, brainstorming the use cases around it all the way through deploying it inside their, uh, inside their industry. What kind of cultural shift Either you're seeing it's too early, actually, and I don't like just the labels and jargons uh, because the reality is different than uh, what we hear and see, or what kind of ch cultural changes you think are needed, once again, from a very practical and realistic manner versus just throwing another jargon out there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just very uh, being data-driven about it, actually. Um, when I was at Kaggle, um, by the time I left that community, we had about uh, just over 5 million users, I want to say. Now, there's a kind of common thought process that people do that do machine learning, you know, are all these PhDs and deeply embedded in, in kind of ML, and they've been doing this for a while. And I can tell you for sure right now that of the 5 million users, the vast majority were not PhDs in machine learning. The vast majority had never academically studied machine learning, right? What they were, where they were... Folks that we will call, and at Predibase we call ML curious. They were engineers that maybe were a data engineer at some point. They were analysts that had a little bit of a statistical background, you know, um, and other kind of types of folks like that. And they were the type of persona, this is why we at Predibase, we love developers. It's because they were the type of persona that were like, give me some good documentation and some good abstractions and I will figure this out. 
That is the type of user we see the most often in our open source communities that picked us up even before Predibase became a company. There are organizations like Ku, which is a um, social networking application uh, based in India, uh, that basically, you know, were looking to be able to build their first models. What they really cared about was not the theory behind machine learning. It wasn't like, what is the right way to optimize a convex loss function? It was, hey, I have content and I need to be able to go ahead and moderate that content. Give me the set of tools that I need that'll allow me to do that in the simplest way possible and that doesn't lock me in. So as I get more advanced, I can dig deeper and deeper. And that's what we've seen increasingly. I think the shift left movement has been most commonly refer like you know associated with security uh, over the time and like with DevSecOps. But I actually think that machine learning has been shifting left silently for a while. Why I say silently, it's because three years ago, it's not like in organizations, you actually saw a lot of engineers starting to do machine learning themselves, but you saw it in the communities. If you looked at the people that used Hugging Face, if you looked at the people in Kaggle, they weren't the MLX, like uh, PhDs. The ML PhDs are also there, but there's 10 to one ratio in terms of like, you know, who's actually active in those communities. And the really cool thing about moving to an API centric model in the last year is now we start to see that in industry and organizations. And so I think that, you know, it was a silent shift that now we've brought to the forefront uh, really in this year. Also, do you see that there are certain industries which can benefit more from LLMs and Genetim or, or you see that, you know, just the way we say, you know, at one point we were told that every industry, every company should be seen as a software company, right? If you don't have a software, you was right. So over time, certainly think it's going to be a case where like software ate the world, so will AI. Um, and I think that that's going to be where it goes. In the short term, though, it's actually useful to be tactical. And what are the types of organizations that have use cases in particular where, you know, um, Gen AI will start to attack first? I think number one, it's going to be organizations that have and deal with a lot of unstructured and especially text data. Now, there's a lot of generative AI models that are coming out in other modalities like images and, um, you know, videos. And we even put out some work earlier that had to do with tabular data. But text has really led the, um, the kind of charge here. And so I think the first type of the uh, area to consider is where is there lots of text data, whether that's customer support automations, whether that's code and others, where you can actually start to see this tactically unfold. And the second and key area is areas where, you know, over the near term, Gen AI is going to be capable of making mistakes or hallucinating, you know, which is in part really a feature rather than a bug. The fact that it can come up with some new creative answers, um, you know, that might be unexpected. And so what we also need to do is make sure we're concentrated in industries and use cases where that type of, um, you know, behavior is acceptable. And it's acceptable for either one of two reasons. One, you know, it's a use case where every once in a while, if it says the wrong thing, it's not going to cause a critical cascading downstream failure. Um, or, and, you know, when it's not in a regulated industry where you need to be able to have heavy emphasis on that explainability. Or number two, um, if it's the case where there's a human in the review, human in the loop process overall. And so those are the types of use cases we're going to likely see. And so I think, you know, generally we've seen these applications picked up the most by tech companies so far, but every organization has interest against it. And I think it's identifying the right use cases and the data that, you know, are going to be best suited for it. Uh, one more question I want to ask, it has nothing to do with open source. It's more or less like there is also a fear, hey, you know what, Genetive AI is going to take away our jobs. But I, I see that the good analogy is Photoshop. Photoshop did not eliminate the jobs of photographers. Actually, it enabled a lot of, you know, even mom and pop shop, uh, regular people to become great photographers. It is a very powerful tool in the right hands. So same, I see is the case with Genetive AI. It will actually enable, it will take care of a lot of, mundane, you know, like even the developers, they really don't have to worry about a lot of low level thing. They can focus on higher, which also means that they can charge more and they can use quality time for quality uh, things. What, what is your opinion? I think my opinion is generative AI is going to replace a lot of jobs and create a lot more new ones. Um, and I think that the, you know, value creation out of the jobs that generate AI, Gen AI is going to create is going to be higher than the jobs that it's going to automate. Um, and so in general, I think what we're going to see is net productivity increase, you know, across the uh, economy of users that uses this. I think we're going to see people no longer have to do those rote and mundane tasks like you were talking about. Like really just think about the processes to be able to do things like, you know, automate extracting information out of documents and putting them into a database and other things along those lines, right? Like those types of tasks 
should not be the ones that we really deploy a lot of human labor against. Instead, the types of tasks we should deploy human labor against, I think increasingly will be new ones that get created where humans work side by side with kind of Gen AI in the loop, doing review and just increasing the cadence and pace at which they're putting out productive applications. Devrat, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about Betterbase and also the whole larger growing ecosystem. Thanks for all those great insights. And I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Really appreciated the time. Thanks for having us.